16. Now we're getting into the nitty gritty. Um, you know, it's interesting how that uh, people are talking about the, the times of the end. There's a, a lady that I met uh, just uh, witnessing to her. Uh, she called about something else, but uh, uh, then I just started talking to her about the Lord. And she said, you know, I, uh, I am also, I interview people for a newspaper that is in like they'll I forget the name of it, but once I get it, I'll let you know. And especially if she puts my interview that she gave that I had with her yesterday into the paper, I'll make sure I get plenty of them, uh, unless it embarrasses me, because you never know what's going to be written. But uh, one of the things that she was asking is, what do you think about the end times, and are we living in the end times? And I'm saying, yes, we're living in the end times. And of course, to the general public, the end times is Armageddon, you know, the, you know um, or no, Russia's going to nuke us and the world's going to be, you know, destroyed by nuclear weapons or whatever else, or uh, that's going to be Armageddon. Well, that's not what the Bible says. But people are interested about the end time. I keep hearing and it just crops up, 666, and people are playing around with the numbers and all that. And they laugh and they scorn and they make it into a superstition. And so we see that people's minds are maybe something is about ready to happen. You know, they talk about the big one or whatever else, you know, as far as earthquakes. And we see, we're going to see an earthquake here in chapter 16. And so God is giving man a uh, sense that something is going to happen. Doomsday, you know, are we doomsday or no? I'm a, you know, I'm a very optimistic person. I'm believing that the Lord's coming and boy, we're going to have a great day. Uh, but unfortunately, there will be a doomsday for those who don't know the Lord. And so she was asking me questions like, should we, um, uh, should we be uh, getting ready for the end times by stocking up uh, materials and stuff like that? I said, well, uh, I don't know when the end times are coming, but it wouldn't be bad with the unstable economy to have a little bit of food, you know, in your house or, you know, to, to plan ahead for any disaster. That's just biblical but I'm not guaranteeing that the Lord is going to come uh, immediately. Uh, but uh, and then I try. But with an interview, how far do you can you go? Because they're just got a certain amount of. So those are the frustrating things about an interview. Is you can't uh, give everything. For instance, she started off with, what, "What do you think are your strengths?" And you hate those kind of questions because you know you don't want to sound braggadocious. But I, immediately I said patience. I thought about patience. But I said, I, I got one of those little things from uh, the fair one time and you fill it out and then they send it to you and they tell you all your strengths and weaknesses. You ever seen those things? But, uh, and I was reading it at the table around with my wife and four kids and it said, your, your greatest strength is your patience. And my wife and all four kids nearly fell out of their chairs laughing. And I'm going... I'm patient with you turkeys. You don't even realize you know, how patient I am. And so I, I almost said patience, but no, I can't because I don't want my kids, if they ever read that, you know, so, you know, you can't win for losing. <laughs> so what do you say? And I said, resilience, you know, or whatever, you know, that I try to stick it out, you know, or whatever. But then, then what are your, some of your weaknesses? Well, if you say resilience, then what is your weakness? Well, every strength has its weakness. So I said, okay, tunnel vision. You know, I, I thought, but there again, you don't want it because all of us are the, yeah, oh, that guy's straight. So, so whatever you say can be, you know, mocked or cycles analyzed uh, with a negative people. Oh, you know, did your mother have any children that lived? You know, and they start off with all these questions, you know. So, you know, so all these things. So people, that, they realize, oh, something's going to happen. And so when you try to give them a straight answer, oh, you're just a doomsday, and I don't believe that. Well, and like, but there again, she said, should, well, um, if there is, do you really believe the Lord's coming? I said, yes. And, well, and she said, well, what's the need of the sage? And I said, well, I have the hope that the Lord's coming, but the Lord says that whosoever uh, has this hope in him uh, purifieth himself even as he is pure. And he, she says, well, uh, there's a lot of people wanting to talk about prophecy. What do you think about prophecy? And there again, the thing that I've said here many times, you really can't preach biblical prophecy without pe preaching biblical purity. 
a lot of people want to know about Armageddon and the seven stars and all the stuff, and the rivers drying up and global warming and all those things, which is all right here in 16. And yet, uh, when you get into purity, and hey, listen, we need to talk, oh, there's a God in heaven. Uh, don't talk to me about that. I just want to know about Nostradamus and how it uh, gets into the Bible. And uh, I know about enough about Nostradamus to stay away from him. Nostradamus is not Daniel. You know, and so uh, stay away from a lot of that stuff that will lead you astray. But now in chapter 16, we see the, the end is coming. I mean, 16 through 19 are the end of the age. I mean, now we're getting down to the last of the horrible judgments. And uh, many of these, we notice that chapter 16, 17, 18 of the book of Revelation are really a composite whole. I mean... They just all tie together. They are a culmination of the great wine, pe- wine press of God's of the wrath of God, which we saw back in chapter 14. God is re- getting ready. The grapes, the grapes of wrath, are are, store, are stirred. So we see that um, um, that God is ready to do something. In chapter 16, we see the judgment of God upon the global ecology. What do we hear today? We hear about globalism. Well, now God's coming after the globalists. Just like every god um, of Egypt was challenged by the ten plagues of Moses upon Pharaoh. And we see now that the, uh, these plagues that are on the earth are so similar in attacking the very gods of this world today. And just like God attacked the gods of Egypt, God is going to attack the God of this world and the gods of this world during the tribulation, excuse me, the tribulation period. So are, is there going to be global warming? We'll see it here. Uh, is there going to be uh, climate change? We're going to see it here. Is there going to be pestilence and all kinds of other things? Yes. Are, are the seas going to be polluted? Yes. Is there going to be water pollution? Yes. Boy, and it's something like you've never seen before. But uh, yeah, I believe in clean, you know, you people know me, I'm a little nutty, I guess. And I, even though that Dominic tells me that, uh, that really most of the recycle bins go into the trash anyway, I just have a thing about wanting to put aluminum and, uh, and paper and other things that are into a, a, a recycle bin rather than into the trash because I don't like this stuff being buried because it gets into the water supply. You know, so I don't know if God tarries, it might, you know, we might have major problems with underground water being polluted. But there again, that is not the end. You know, that's just, uh, you know, the Lord sent us to this earth to, you know, to, to till it, or as the Lord gave to, to Adam and the, to us. Now we're to, we're to be the uh, conservators of the earth. And so, yes, do I believe in conservation? Yes, not the nutty stuff that we're hearing from the environmentalist. But at the same time, a godly person is good to animals. A godly person is good to people. <laughs> a godly person is, 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 wants to make sure that uh, his uh, water runoff isn't hurting his neighbor because he loves his neighbor and all those things. So, you know, I believe in environmentalism biblically. And so we see that now that... Um, but it, but we see the globalists say that we're going to control everything. We're going to even control, have you heard this now? Uh, gas stoves. We're going to take them out of your house because gas stoves? It really, it's more than just control. And have, have people heard that, haven't they? And going after the appliances uh, of your... And so we got people in our government right now that are wanting to control everything in your house. And so... How far do we go with that, uh, you know, and, and environmentalism? And really, it's now we're going to control everything that you do. And the God of this world wants total control. Globalism. And this whole idea of no borders is globalism. We don't, we don't need, you know, doctors without borders. It sounds great. So the doctors without borders is we just don't worry about your nationality or whatever. But we are teaching globalism. And world communism, and really, and uh, communism is an old word that uh, dates you immediately. But uh, basically, the end result of Marxism was communism, which means everything that people have in common. Now, 
as we saw in Acts chapter 2, there is no such thing as Christian communism. Uh, we saw that uh, even though a lot of people gave uh, everything they had, there were still people that owned houses. They still met it to Mark's mother's house. Uh, Lydia still had a whole bunch of money. You know, uh, a lot of other people that God blessed, they didn't give everything up for communism. Uh, and uh, even though uh, Barnabas gave up a lot, he still could get around and support himself even on the mission field. And so it wasn't that you gave up everything and everybody pooled their money together uh, and had collectivism. But that's what basically we're being taught today. But those who are teaching it, there's always that people that have to control it. And so that's what we're seeing today. And this will be a great, this will be an attack on world, whatever you want to call it, uh, socialism, communism, collectivism, uh, nirvana, utopia, whatever. The world is trying to come up with a utopia. And so God is going to attack that because there's no heaven without God. And so we see uh, as the plagues of Egypt, in which we were well, a direct attack upon the gods of Egypt, these plagues show the utter helplessness of Satan. Of course, remember he's cast to earth. The beast and the false prophet, that unholy trinity which we've studied. Uh, through these judgments, we see just how God has blessed us in this physical world and just how horrible life can be when he withdraws those blessings. And God's blessed us with good health, hasn't he? And sometimes he sends a little sickness along just for us to see how good we had it. Doesn't he? And why do we have death? Boy, it keeps us humble. I mean, there's nothing like death in a family or a loved one that just will knock you down to your foundations. How prideful would we be in this world today if there was no death? But there's something about death. There's something on that other side that even the strongest of people who call themselves atheists or whatever, they have to wonder about it at times. And even the atheist, at the funeral, they'll say, somebody, he's looking down from, they realize there's something out there. It's so interesting to hear that. And you hear these ungodly people, and they mock Christianity and all that, and then they stand up and give a eulogy at some famous person's funeral, and he's looking down on, wait a minute, if you're an atheist, doesn't life end? And so it's interesting how that God has just put it into a, uh, to our hearts that there's something out there beyond us. And of course, we know that it's him. So now as we get into it, we see what we call the bold judgments, or as the King James says, the vile judgments, V-I-A-L, uh, which is a bowl. And so, or we would think of them as a test tube today. But uh, uh, so we see these things are about ready to be poured out. And that we took chapters 14 and 15 to, as a prelude to this. I mean, just how that the grapes of wrath are now ready to be stirred and, you know, he's trampled out the vintage where those grapes of wrath are stored. Well, now God is about ready to pour out that wrath. And of course, Satan's on earth. So now it's a direct attack on Satan and everything that he's doing. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple. Temple where? The temple in heaven. Um, and we're going to be looking at that again this morning. You know, there's a temple in heaven, and God considered the temple on earth and the Holy of Holies his footstool. It's kind of interesting. Now, so there's a great temple in heaven with seraphim and so forth, but uh, that picture of the ark and the uh, uh, David called it. He said when he, when he wanted to build a temple, he said, we're making a footstool uh, for the Lord. Or we were building a house for the footstool of the Lord, or the, meaning the Ark of the Covenant. And so it's kind of interesting. So what a weird to do. We're to worship at Jesus' feet, aren't we? <laughs> so at his footstool. So uh, it's, uh, we see that, uh, then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying with the seven temples, or with the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath. There's those grapes of wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured his bowl upon the earth. And a foul and loathsome sore came upon men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Notice not everybody because there are certain people out there that have been saved and they have not taken the mark of the beast. But everybody that had, we see, that it kind of corresponds with that, uh, that uh, plague, the sixth plague of Egypt in Exodus 9, 8 through 11. 
where the dust and the ashes was stirred up in the air and it caused boils from the head to the feet. And old, you know, old, uh, um, Moses went in and talked to Pharaoh and Pharaoh was mad because he was sore all over. And so uh, here we see that uh, there's this, um, this, the dust and the ashes that it's fitting, the prince of the power of the air has no remedy. Now we're talking about a plague, nothing like having sores that, uh, that you can't heal. And the earth and the, their air and the sea and the rivers, their cities, and all consigned uh, over the, uh, uh, to, to ruin. Uh, well, I see what um, Matthew Henry says, the earth, the air, the sea, the rivers, the, the cities, all consigned over to ruin, all accursed for the sake of the wickedness of that people. And so we see that, you know, it doesn't matter whether you live in a city or out in the desert, everybody who's taken the mark of the beast is going to, and so there's no remedy. There's no vaccine to take care of it. And so they're going to suffer. Can you imagine? I mean, it's bad enough to have a sore in a place where you can't sit down or you can't move around, walk or, or on your shoulder or whatever else. But to have them all over your body. Uh, I think um, I'd want to do a little bit of praying, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Or at least... Uh, That'd be a miserable existence. But then uh, we see the second bowl is poured out. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea. And it became blood as a dead man. Now, what, uh, which one, what uh, uh, does that remind you of in Exodus? The river turning to blood. Now, it doesn't say the sea turned to blood, but it became blood as of a dead man. So whatever it was, it was, uh, you know, it was red. I mean, it was it was icky, let's put it that way. Um, it was polluted. And it became blood as a dead man. And every living creature in the sea died. Now, we saw earlier in one of the judgments where a third of the sea died. Now, all everything in the sea dies. Oh, can you imagine that? So we know that the, those days have to be shortened because this is the end. And if everything in the sea dies, the world's not going to last very much longer, Right? And so, but can you imagine the stink of, you know, even the river out here, if all the fish in that river just uh, came up and died on the bank? Yuck, <laughs> you know. So there again, uh, you know, I saw a, on my, the way to a church this morning out on Newburgh, um, I saw, uh, I thought it was one of those dumb geese we got around here that you got to wait for them to walk across with all the, but it was actually a, a, some type of buzzard that was eating something, that roadkill out in the middle of the road. And you go, yuck. But can you imagine the feast that those birds are going to have? And th in fact, the Bible talks about that later on, how that the birds are going to gather, gather, gather around all the dead things. I mean, that's yucky. <laughs> you know, just think, I mean, this is, just think about the picture here and the smell. It's going to be a rough time. But, you know, it's interesting. When God decides that he's going to punish somebody, he can do a good job of it. I mean, every molecule, all he's got to do is change one molecule in your body, and he could cause you all kinds of pain, if not death. Misery. One little cell goes wrong, and all of a sudden you got cancer. And so just... Or one little nodule in your nose goes bad and all of a sudden you got all kinds of sinus problems. Now, of course, you say, well, wait a minute. Does God have judgment? No, we're just all sinners and we live in a sin-cursed world and so we're going to catch some of those things. But it ain't nothing like whenever God withdraws his blessings upon us and upon the world. But when I say ain't nothing, I better be careful. I got a third grade school teacher that will correct me when I get home. Um, isn't there isn't anything <laughs> there aren't anything that uh so here we see the uh the the second bowl uh the sea turns to blood the plague corresponds with the first um and of course with the trumpet judgment where a third of the sea is going to be perishing in the first part of the tribulation but in the last everything dies and the stench of that is not only now you got sores and you got st uh, uh, these things are going to be overlapping so just as soon as one is starting to subside a little bit, the next one takes over. Or maybe both, all of them together. We don't know exactly you know, where, where those concentric circles are going to uh, overlap. 
But uh, can you imagine not being able to move around without hurting and then the smell and everything else that's around? God knows how to make things miserably. And then we see the third. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who, was, uh, who is to be, because you have judged these things. For you have shed the blood of the saints, for they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. So you, yes, there's a lot of, Satan is killing a lot of people as soon as they get saved, and people that won't take the mark of the beast, and the Lord is pouring out his wrath upon them, but also knows the fresh water. The fresh water now is turning like the blood again, like the first, uh, and now, so that tells us that if the water supply of the earth is, so we're talking about the last months now of the tribulation. I mean, it's really getting hot, literally and figuratively. And so things are changing. And notice everything here is, no, not, is going against the gods of this world today. You know, the air we breathe, the, the water we drink, and, you know, uh, environmentalism and all this stuff. Uh, and there again, like I said, I'm, not a, I'm an environmentalist, biblically. And I, but at the same time, the government can't control everything especially the temperature, and that's what we're going to see in a moment. In verse 8 and 9, notice he says, um, uh, well, you go back to verse nine, uh, verse 7, he says, And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. So notice uh, there's in heaven saying, Okay, Lord, they deserve it. Satan deserves it. And the people who follow Satan deserve it. Now in verse 8, then the fourth poured out his bowl on the sun and power was given to him to scorch the men with fire. Now does that sound like global warming? Something that you've never seen before. You want global warming? You're going to get it. <laughs> um, and men who scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues and they did not repent and give him glory. Now we see man that has turned totally away from God. The more that God does to him, the matter they get at God. That's scary because there's people that I talk to and they're mad at God. And the more that God um, withdraws his blessing from the life, the matter they get at God. Uh, I'm dealing with, the, I think of uh, just a couple of people popped in my mind right now. They're mad at God. Why did God allow this to happen? And the more that God plagues them, the more it matters they get at God. Um, I just was talking to some, well, I just said, you know, your biggest problem is pride. I mean, you know, and I was just kind of honest with him. I said, until you really understand there's God in heaven, you're going to stay mad at him until you submit yourself to him. And he's working. Either you get mad or you get glad. But there's God in heaven that controls you. And you're getting frustrated because you can't control him. You expect him just to pander to your every need. And if he doesn't give you exactly what you want, then you're going to get mad at him. Well, he that sits in the heaven laughs at that type of thing. It's kind of like the little boy. Remember those old movies where the little boy is trying to hit the, hit the bigger man. The man just holds his hand out there and the boy's trying to punch real hard and all that. Well, you know, that's silly. You're not going to beat God. Um, it's kind of like uh, we used to, you know, uh, like I was, uh, in a on the worldly sense, uh, like the old advice, you're not going to beat your wife. I mean, when I said, you're not going to win against your wife is a better way to put it. Uh, you can either be happy or you can be right, which one you will take. So, you know, <laughs> but uh, but uh, no, you either can be happy or you can sm and be, submit yourself to God or you can be miserable. One of the two. But now in verse 10, he says, And the fifth angel poured out his bowl, and the throne of the beast and his kingdom, notice the beast, became full of darkness. Does that sound like another plague of Egypt? Yes, it does. And they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. And what happened? They turned to God, right? 
No, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. So again, we see people who turn away from God just get madder and madder and madder at him, more angry and angrier at him. And so um, and we see this is ultimately uh, true in the tribulation period, but the end is coming. And so then we see the sixth plague. And the sixth plague, the angel poured out his a bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its waters were dried up so that the way of the kings of the east may be prepared. And we'll see the preparation from Armageddon. The kings of the east, who are the kings of the east? China. And now we're seeing not only that, but we're seeing a, a unification of China with a lot of other. I wouldn't be surprised if Japan finds a way to, to rejoin China. No, well, there again, it doesn't look like it right now. I'm, I'm not predicting anything. I'm just saying the kings of the East, who are they? But it's amazing um, what God can do or what God will allow. Uh, he says, and I saw, and there again, I'm glad, that, don't get me wrong, uh, especially if we're so sensitive today. Uh, we got missionaries in Japan right now and Japanese are good people and they're our allies. So I'm not downing Japan. I'm just saying they're in the East and we saw what happened before and we see what happened, to you, and you say, well, my, yeah, well, you're condemning them. No, the things that happened in Germany and Japan in the 30s can happen right, it's already happening right here in the United States. So can we become like that, those countries? Yes. And so I'm not, you have to be so careful. We're not trying to down anybody. I'm just saying, you know, what are the kings of the East? And how can things change? So the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and the water dried up so that the way of the kings of the east were prepared. There's something about that Euphrates and around that area that most, if not uh, most of the demonology and the mysticism of the world comes from that area. And you think back all the way back to Daniel and all and the Assyrians and the Babylonians and go back to Nimrod. And so, it, and we see that, of course, many of those people uh, you know, the attacks on, on the Lord Jesus and all that uh, come. And so we saw, and I saw a third of the unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. Dragon, of course, is Satan. <clears throat> in the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophets. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the great battle of the, of the day of God Almighty. What battle is that? So notice he's preparing for Armageddon. Even now. So we see the time is short. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and see his shame. And so that's what the Lord says. So, you know, beware. These days are coming. You say, well, uh, should I store up food? Yeah, I don't know when they're coming. So, you know, if the, glo if the um, government shutdown happens next week and our whole economy goes bust like they're predicting or whatever, uh, my wife and I have a couple of cans of Campbell's soup in the, in the cupboard, I think, or a few other things. We've tried to store up a little few. But there again, if everybody's hungry, they'll break into my house to get it anyway. So, it's, you know, it's uh, well, we're talking about riots in the street and everybody dog eat dog. And so I don't know exactly how to prepare. You know, should I put bars on my windows and, you know, uh, cannons in my, you know, up and up and whatever. What do I do? You know, you can't, you just have to ask God for protection. But, but is that Armageddon? No. Uh, Armageddon is going to be, uh, I'm out of here. When Armageddon, I'm not going to be here. Remember, we're going to be out of here at this time. But notice what God is doing. And then in uh, chapter 16, verse 12, uh, well, we, we see the uh, river Euphrates dries up and the kings of the earth. It's a spiritism. The Old Testament prophes repeatedly prophesied, and I gave you some verses here about the drying up of the Euphrates. Uh, Isaiah 11, 15. Um, Jeremiah 50, verses 35 through 38. Zechariah 10, 11. Those are just three verses. It talks about that mysterious river drying up during the last days 
And uh, there again, this is a survey, so we're not going to go deep into that right now, but I give you for future study if you want to study that. Then the seventh bowl. And we see then the seventh bowl poured out uh, into the air. There again, pollution. Uh, and the loud voice came from the temple of heaven, from the throne saying, it is done. And these were the noises and thunderings and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, the big one. So a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since man, uh, men were on the earth. Boy, it's going to be a big one. Is it going to be the great uh, San Andreas fault? I don't know. Uh, you know, you hear about the rim of fire and the, and the plates of the earth are groaning together now. I don't know where it's going to be, and I'm not going to predict, but it's going to be a big one. It's going to be a humdinger. And so we see, and he says, now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. We'll get into that, what city we're talking about uh, in the future. And Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. We'll talk about Babylon next week. Uh, and then every island fled away, and the mountains uh, were not found, uh, and the great hail from heaven fell upon man, and each hailstone weighed about a talent. A talent is 90 pounds. Now, we've had some hail damage in our, on our roofs, but can you imagine a 90-pound hailstone falling on your roof? You think it might cause some damage? Uh, Anna, do you think it might tear up your car lot? <laughs> uh, aren't you glad you won't be here <laughs> you'll be watching and say go ahead and hit those cars I didn't like them anyway no whatever no but uh, there again uh, this is going to be a bad I mean does the Lord know how to how to chasten his people and even more so does he know how to chasten those who aren't his people who follow the God of this world and so we see uh, that uh, it fell upon men and each hailstone weighed about 90 pounds. Men, and notice what happens, because they've already turned away from God, men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. Notice when a man gets to the point where he continually rejects God, no matter what God does for him, he just gets madder. And he gets more angry. And he is self-destroyed. And then you say, well, you, know, you think about uh, how that, uh, the Nazis were given over to demonism and they fought to the very last day. You know, again, why didn't they give up? I mean, we're over, no, they still, there was something about them. And even today, no matter how bad it looks, there are still people out there that have given themselves over to that, that still have that ideology. And, they, and are they mad at God? Yes. And uh, by the way, you know, uh, they are not conservative, you know, Americans. A Nazi is not a conservative American, uh, you know, or whatever. And so uh, it's interesting now that anybody who wants to stand for the Lord is equated with evil. Behold those who call evil good and good evil. And so we have to make sure that we can identify biblically who are the evil people and who are the good. And yet at the same time, love the evil people because we don't know which one of those that God wants to save. But there's coming a time where we know that uh, God gives them over. And we know two types, uh, two types, uh, two things that will keep you from heaven. One is death, and the other is that mark of the beast, which we won't have to worry about. We'll be gone if you're a Christian. But those who are left are going to, they're going to suffer badly. But oh, that God would, you know, the people that are angry with God today, I hope they get saved because they're prime candidates to be right here seven years from now if the Lord comes today. And so let's pray that God will, will bless. Father, thank you again for your word. Now, Lord, we pray that we can issue warnings and love to a people. And yet, Lord, we know it's interesting how, Lord, you, you control these things, and yet you give us the eternal message to go out and preach the gospel to the lost and dying world. So, Lord, uh, we pray that... Uh, you will allow us to see where, great, where sin abounds. We want to see that grace much more abounding. Lord, show us what you can do in an evil world. 
in this age of grace in saving souls and turning them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto yourself. Bless, we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen.